and IP, accelerating innovation and creativity. <clears throat> In 2023, we celebrate the can-do attitude of women inventors, creators, and entrepreneurs around the world and their groundbreaking work. World IP Day was started in 2000 when the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, members, stated des um, member states designated April 26th, the day on which the WIPO convention came in, into force in 1970 as World IP Day with the aim of increasing general intellectual um, understanding of intellectual property. Our goal here at the TCA is to help the innovators and entrepreneurs of New Mexico learn about intellectual property and how to protect it. We offer no cost confidential counseling regarding intellectual property. We do require you to register. My name is Stephanita Rawlings and I am the coordinator of the Technology Commercialization Accelerator. We are a, pro a program sponsored by the New Mexico Small Business Network. I would like to give special thanks to Christopher Garcia. He continues to help set up and monitor the TCA webinars. Christopher is a business development specialist at the SBDC at UNM Valencia. Christopher has a background in e-commerce and single member home-based businesses. This year, our World IP Celebration lineup consists of presenters from the United States Copyright Office and the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Our first presenter, Ashley Tucker, will be presenting Women in the Copyright System and Copyright Registration. Do you want to wave, Ashley? At one, one o'clock this afternoon, Susan Anthony from the United States Patent and Trademark Office will be presenting Intellectual Property and Indigenous Peoples Culture Heritage in the US and abroad. A little background about our presenters. Ashley Tucker is a public affairs specialist in the Public Information and Education Division of the United States Copyright Office where she is responsible for conducting outreach to various copyright community stakeholders by preparing and executing education, educational material and activities. Ashley develops strategies for motivating the participation of those within underserved communities to enhance their engagement with the copyright system. Susan Anthony is an attorney advisor in the Office of Policy and International Affairs and the U.S. Patent Trademark Office, where she is a member of the trademark team. Within the Office of Policy and International Affairs, Susan is the lead on trademarks for the Africa and China teams. Her work also includes traditional culture expressions and educational outreach to American Indian and Alaska Native tribes as she serves as the USPTO's tribal liaison, uh, tribal affairs liaison to the United States Department of Commerce. Susan has over 35 years experience and expertise in almost all facets of the intellectual property protection and enforcement, both domestic and international. Each presenter will have a Q&A session after, the, after their presentation. We will enter, um, you can enter the questions that you have in the Q&A tab down on the bottom. Before we hear from Ashley Tucker, I'm going to provide a brief overview of the New Mexico Small Business Intellectual Program called Technology Commercialization Accelerator at New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology here in Socorro, New Mexico. <clears throat> the TCA works closely with other agencies throughout New Mexico. We work with other SBDC small business development center agencies to assist clients with business startups and IP intellectual property strategy. We also provide our clients information on other agencies that will help our clients move forward with their ideas. We try and educate 
our clients on what intellectual property is, why we want to protect it, and steps needed to protect one's intellectual property. A little background about the TCA office. We opened up the office three years ago during the pandemic. I started with a laptop, a phone, and a website. We have been operating as a virtual office, and now we have an office in downtown Socorro, New Mexico. We meet with our clients, and our scheduled appointments are via Zoom meetings, telephone calls, or in person. We provide free webinars uh, regarding intellectual property via the New Mexico Small Business Network. You can view the schedule and register at nmsbdc.org. The New Mexico Small Business Network also has a YouTube channel where our recorded webinars can be viewed at your convenience. The TCA's website is located at nmt.edu forward slash TCA. At the TCA, we are here to, to help you move forward with your idea. Schedule a meeting with the Technology Commercialization Accelerator to learn about moving your ideas forward. We will now move forward with our guest speaker, Ashley Tucker. Hello there, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here with you all. All right. Hello, and again, happy World IP Day. My name is Ashley Tucker, as Steffi mentioned, and I'm a public affairs specialist here in the Copyright Office. I work within the public information and education section, and I am looking forward to speaking with you all today about women in copyright and copyright registration. Ashley, uh, yeah. share, your share your different screen. Uh-oh. Okay. Let's see. Let's so, see Ashley, now oh. you, oh. you can sorry. navigate to display settings and switch. Yeah, there we go. Well, one second. It's actually not allowing... I'm so sorry about this. Bear with me. It's okay. You're okay. <laughs> okay. Hmm. It's not. And go. Okay. One slide back, please, would be great. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, before I get started on today's topics, I just wanted to take a minute to recognize World IP Day, um, echoing what Steffi said. It's today, April 26th, and this is an annual international event organized by the World Intellectual Property Organization, also known as WIPO, to recognize and learn about the role that IP plays in encouraging creativity and innovation. And again, this year's theme is Women in IP, Accelerating Innovation and Creativity. And the Copyright Office, along with many other government agencies and other organizations, were celebrating the can-do attitude of women inventors, creators, and entrepreneurs like yourselves around the world and their groundbreaking contributions. Next slide, please. So to get us started, what is the Copyright Office? So the U.S. Copyright Office was founded in, nine, or excuse me, 1870, and it lives within the Library of Congress, which is the world's largest library. It's located here in Washington, D.C. And simply put, our duty is to administer the copyright law. And what that looks like is advising Congress and the courts, participating in international delegations, serving the public by answering questions, and providing them with a wide range of resources, as well as operating the nation's registration and recordation systems. Next slide. Earlier this year, the Copyright Office published its 2022 to 2026 strategic plan, which features the office's four strategic pillars, and that includes copyright for all, continuous development, imperial expertise, and an enhanced use of data. Next slide, thank you. 
Again, today on World IP Day, the spotlight is on women in the world of intellectual property. And I can say, as a woman in IP myself, the Copyright Office is an exciting atmosphere in which to work. Women have played a vital role throughout the history of the US Copyright Office. And here we're celebrating the five women who have served and are serving as leaders of the office. Um, What's amazing is women have directed the office consecutively since November of 1993. And these five lawyers that are pictured here have contributed over 100 years of public service to the Copyright Office collectively. Um, on the left from Barbara Ringer, who was the first woman register of copyrights and widely recognized as a principal architect of the Copyright Act of 1976 to Shira Perlmutter, our current register, who leads a workforce of nearly 500 employees and directs the administration of important provisions of the US Copyright Act. So the Copyright Office has a robust history of strong women leaders with legacies that continue to thrive. Next slide. Just last June, we issued a special report on women in co the copyright system, looking at data around copyright registrations between 1978 and 2020. And the report provides us with an evolving picture of women's participation in the creative professions over time. For example, the publicly available data that we used in this report shows that the share of women authors and registrations is substantially smaller than women's participation rates in associated copyright related occupations. So what that means is that some women are not receiving the full benefits of the copyright system. And our report is a helpful contribution to ongoing domestic and international discussions on the gender gap and the use of intellectual property systems. For example, the US Patent and Trademark Office has also reported on similar topics, especially related to patents, finding that there are gender gaps ranging from STEM education to invention and entrepreneurship to IP legal representation. So we here at the Copyright Office, we firmly believe that additional outreach and education can assist in closing these gaps and continue, we're continuing to do that work particularly through our strategic plan. Again, I mentioned one of those goals is quote unquote copyright for all. And the focus of this goal is to make the copyright system more accessible for everyone, especially those in underrepresented communities. So we also recently hired a chief economist who will continue to identify additional areas of study as well. I will encourage you all to um, find this report on our website at copyright.gov to read more. Next slide. So World IP Day encompasses all components of intellectual property. And when we talk about copyright, it's important to distinguish it from other types of intellectual property. So here they are listed here. Um, trademarks are a tool that prevents a company from adopting a name or a tagline or a product configuration that is confusingly similar to that used by a competitor. Trademarks help consumers identify the source of what they are buying or using. Patents, they protect in inventions and discoveries, ideas, processes, methods, concepts, machines, and devices. Copyright, on the other hand, protects the expression of an idea, not the idea itself. So the exact words or form choos chosen to convey that idea is what is protected by copyright. Lastly, there are trade secrets, and they're not listed here, but they're another type of IP for consideration. Next slide. So what is copyright? Copyright law, which is found in Title 17 of the U.S. Code, protects original works of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. This means that first we must have, quote, a, a work of authorship, and that work must be original, and it must be fixed. Now, there are countless ways a work can be fixed. In order to meet this requirement, the work must be either written or recorded or otherwise captured in a copy or phono record 
and it must be sufficiently permanent or stable to be perceived, reproduced, or otherwise communicated for more than a transitory duration of time. So the key takeaway here is copyright protection begins the moment the work is fixed. It does not start when the work is registered with our office. Next slide. So section 102A of the copyright law provides a list of categories of works that constitute copyrightable subject matter. That list includes the types of works that can be protected by copyright. So that's literary works, musical works, um, that's including any accompanying words um, or lyrics, dramatic works, pantomimes, pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works, motion pictures and other audiovisual works, sound recordings, architectural works. As you can see in the uh, parentheticals, these ca categories are very broad and encompass many different types of works within those overarching terms. Um, some lesser known works that we do register here include computer programs, that's a type of literary work, um, we register fabric and wallpaper designs and video games as well. Architectural works were added the last, uh, most recently um, in the year 1990, and that includes buildings that are habitable and also includes the blueprints. Next slide. Next slide when you're ready. So while we just saw that copyright law protects a wide variety of works that span many categories, there are also works and materials that inherently fall outside of copyright protection. So section 102B of the law gives some examples of materials that does not constitute copyrightable subject matter. Um, that would include ideas, procedures, processes, systems, methods of operation, concepts, principles, and discoveries. Um, some, of, some of these, however, are protected by patents. However, I will note that even patents don't protect uh, mere suggestions of an idea. Next slide. So let's look at what it means for a work to be original. So in terms of originality, if you submit a copyright registration application for a work you have created, registration specialists or examiners in the office are going to look for two elements. They're gonna look at independent creation and they're gonna look for creativity. So independent creation means that the work must be independently created by the author. So what we mean by this is that the work must be original for, from the author and not copied from another work. So in theory, two works could be the same or very similar and each could be subject to copyright protection. So for example, um, you know, if I wrote the nursery rhyme, Mary had a little lamb and someone else wrote the nursery rhyme, Mary had a little lamb, so long as we didn't copyright, copy one another, they may be protected within the scope of copyright law. The next requirement for orig originality is sufficient creativity. So sufficient creativity, Creativity requires that the work contains at least a small amount of creative expression, but that small amount has to be more than trivial. So example of works that do not meet the requirement for originality, that might be words, short phrases, um, titles, slogans, familiar symbols and designs, um, simple geometric shapes, typography or typeface, um, mere variation in coloring, those are all things that wouldn't fit within the scope of copyright law. So registering your work, it's not necessary, but it does have a number of legal benefits, including it creates a public record of your claim to copyright, but most importantly, registration is a prerequisite to filing a copyright infringement lawsuit for the for a U.S. work. So this means that if a work is infringed, that work must be registered with the U.S. Copyright Office, or the office must have issued a refusal letter um, for this registration in order to file a copyright infringement lawsuit. So what's needed in order for registration, it's listed here. You will need to submit a complete application, a deposit or a copy of the work, 
and the fee. And that fee depends on the type of work and how many works you're registering with that application. Of course, all of that information is on our website. Uh, we, of course, offer a lot of other in-depth resources, more detailed printable resources for creators. Um, we've got circulars such as Copyright Basics. Um, we have Circular 33, which is Works Not Protected. Um, we've got uh, circulars on website and website content, various learning engine videos on our YouTube channel, um, engage page, which is our pages that are broken out based on the type of creator, lots of re resources on the website. Another resource that the Copyright Office provides is the Copyright Claims Board or the CCB. The CCB is a tribunal with expertise um, lawyers in copyright matters, and this board is available to resolve copyright disputes of a relatively low economic value as an efficient, less expensive alternative to federal court. Um, this implementation of the CCB is another milestone in achieving that goal of copyright for all, making the copyright system more accessible to those of all walks of life. Again, serving the public is one of our utmost priorities. And in addition to our copyright specialists or our copyright examiners, it is primarily our public information office that provides authoritative copyright information to the public by answering phone inquiries and record, responding to written correspondence. And it is our outreach and education office that establishes educational programs such as public programming, um, subject-specific presentations such as this one, online resources, and various other publications as well. So as we wrap up and prepare to open the floor for questions, I'd like to encourage you all to visit our Find Yourself in Copyright exhibit, which explores how U.S. copyright law has evolved and has the million, it has, it represents a lot of copyright claims within the millions of claims that we've received over time. Um, and it il illustrates the very nature of original works. Um, the, the exhibit is located on the fourth floor of the James Madison building uh, in Washington, DC in the Library of Congress. And while we would love to have all of you in person to walk amongst the artifacts in the exhibit, I'll also note that the exhibit is accessible online as well. So um, as we conclude, I will have you shift to the last slide, which is just a list of our contact information. Um, please feel free to reach out to us by way of following us on Twitter, our YouTube page. We also have a Newsnet subscription program where we kick out our current news um, by way of email. But again, we've got contact information for our public information office if you'd like to speak to someone. Um, and you're also welcome to come in person. With that being said, I'm happy to open the floor up for questions. Perfect, I'll moderate for you, Ashley. And if anybody on the call right now has a question, please type it into the Q&A or raise your hand and I could allow you to speak. I see. Ms. Denby, let me allow you to speak. You are muted, unmute yourself, and then you could ask your question. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, ma'am, as well. But thank you, Ashley, um, very much for your time and to give the presentation today. And so my question is, and so, um, so let's say if I like make different um, products, so I make jewelry. And so what would that fall under which category? And then two, and then how about for the business name? Can that be, say, copyrighted? And then what category would that fall under? Sure. So um, when you're thinking about a business, there are components of that business that would fall within copyright protection, and some of them would be um, a matter for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. So 
Um, the jewelry design itself may or may not be uh, protected under copyright law. It depends on the design um, and the level of creativity. Um, however, you know, if you have a company website, any text or images that are on that website could be pr possibly protected. Um, any sort of company descriptions could be protected. Um, but in terms of the look and feel, the name, um, the colors, those things, those would fall under trademark. Does that answer? Well, um, yes, ma'am. And now it's also too, is so say that I make um, um, personal care products. So, so let's just say maybe a, um, a facial scrub or like a, a body butter. So what mm -hmm. would that fall under? Would that be different? for the type of trademark. So say, so if I um, just named it uh, maybe uh, two rocks and a bird. So then, <laughs> right. And so, but can I trademark that name two rocks and a bird for say my body butter? Actually, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about down there. A lot of people would sell like body butters and scrubs and things like that. <laughs> well, I, I will say that copyright does not protect useful articles. So something that has an intrinsic purpose, such as a lotion or a product of that nature. However, mm -hmm. some of the branding around that, so, so you may have a logo, again, a website, maybe packaging um, that has a sufficient degree of creativity. Those are elements that, that you may want to submit to the, the copyright office for protection. Some right. of uh, some of those categories, and we have USPTO, I believe, with us today um, on the call now. Some of those would fall under the trademark, trademark, um, patent and trademark office. Right. And now, how about for the logo? That would go under copyright. And so, let's say if I have my own logo and all that mm -hmm. that's already right um, been designed, how do I protect that logo or say from someone else? Yeah. Sure, yeah, I would encourage you to register the logo um, that again would look like you submitting it to the copyright office alongside a application and the fee and um, an examiner will determine if it meets the le level of creativity. However, simply going through that process is the prerequisite for you to um, file an infringement case if, if it came to that. So if heaven forbid someone infringed upon your artwork, your logo, you could either take your um, approval letter or your refusal letter to court as a prerequisite to make that claim. Okay. And then, on, and, and like normally, so say, what is the cost, but does it change or so? But so, so say for example, so if I have three different, um, say as well, but logos, like one for the jewelry, but for my personal care, and then one for say my clothing designs. So that would be three different logos and then three different applications. So or can I put them well, all under um, the same applications? So if I have like three different logos, yeah, but it's the same person, it's me. Sure, yeah. So we have um, a variety of different application types. We have applications for single works, but we also have group application op options. There are some um, boundaries around, you know, how many works and what types of works can be combined onto one application. But um, something like, you know, multiple logos, we do have an application that would accept up to 10 logos. Um, I, I can't quote you the prices right off, but that information is online. And again, please contact our public information office if you want specific pricing for that. Um, but it will be dependent on the types of works, how many works, um, things like that. Okay, great. Thank you. That was awesome. Sure. Perfect. We have uh, two questions in the Q&A and then I have some hands up, so I'll allow, uh, we'll do Steffi and then Susan. So the first question in the Q&A are, is, are there workshops that provide do-it-yourself instruction to file within the different categories of protections? And if so, how do we learn about them? 
Sure. So in terms of uh, workshops, we do have a lot of educational programming. I don't know if specifically on that topic. However, I will say that on our website, we have a speaker request form and that you can fill out if you would like um, someone from our office to come and give a talk similar to this one, or maybe, you know, something like that, a walkthrough on how to register um, in the system. That's certainly something that we could set up. Um, and discuss. So if you go to our website, copyright.gov slash speaker request, um, you can fill out that form and that will come into our office and we can set something up. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to let Susan ask her question. Susan. Sure. I was simply going to rescue Ashley from having to answer a trade name question because I believe uh, that the lady who just spoke was interested in protecting her business name. And we get those questions all the time at the USPTO and it's good to see that our brethren get the same question. But the reality is that a business name, unless it is used as a trademark, uh, is actually uh, registered, if you will, with your uh, state corporation commission, your secretary of state. The procedures differ state by state, but that's where you would go to get your business name. And then there may be a requirement to do something locally where you're actually located within the state. But a trade name is separate from a copyright, is separate from a trademark. And so that's all I had wanted to say, Chris. Thank you. I'm going to go to the next question in the Q&A. Does, does a copyright protect an innovative instructional approach used to provide an innovative service in wellness? It's a lot of information in that question there. <laughs> that sounds like that would fall, again, fall under USPTO, US uh, Patent and Trademark Office, because it sounds like it's along the lines of a method or a procedure, um, an invention, those things are all over to our um, friends at the USPTO, Susan, Susan's colleagues. And similarly, there's a question that says, are methods, approaches, or processes protected? And if Susan, you want to clarify anything about that, you go ahead. Not by copyright. I will say that this is a question that we get with some frequency as well. Within the last couple of weeks, I've been at the NAM trade show, which I've, uh, in which I've participated for, gosh, 15 years now, not counting the years of the pandemic. Uh, and the NAM show is all about music products, music products that support the entertainment industry, that support the educational, music educational industry, and so forth. And we get that kind of question all the time. People have a very innovative method of teaching music, for example. I think that we've gotten at least one of these questions per NAM show. Um, and people get very excited because they say, we've listened very carefully to what you had to say, Susan, and it wouldn't be protected by patent. We're obviously not talking about a trademark, but we heard you when you talked about copyright. And so we understand exactly what we need to do. We need to write down, we're gonna write an article all about our creative method. And then we're going to go get that registered, that article registered at the US Copyright Office and voila. And so then I sit there and I say, well, gosh, I don't know whether it's my inability to teach or your inability to take on board what I've taught. But that's a question that we get quite frequently and the answer is, uh, no, your best bet would be if there is some sort of patent protection, but that as, as Ashley has noted is also in the USPTO uh, wheelhouse, but using a copyrighted article in order to try to protect an idea, that isn't gonna work. I see Steffi has her hand up. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Steffi? Uh, no, I, I'm... Um, if Ashley could talk a little bit about the circulars that are available from the Yeah, absolutely. So we have circulars. Um, they are essentially handouts that are broken down by um, subject matter. So again, copyright basics, um, the registration process, 
Um, we've got quite a number of different ones. Um, what is publication? Uh, defining the author, defining the claimant, some of those key terms. Also excited to announce that we recently released um, a, a, quite a number of Spanish translated materials as well. So a lot of those circulars have been translated into Spanish, again, with the goal of making copyright accessible for all walks of life. We are still continuing this program. So we are continuously um, translating our materials into Spanish. And those are all accessible online, copyright.gov slash CIRCS, C-I-R-C. And I can put that in the chat if it's accessible to everyone. That would be very helpful. Thank you, Ashley. Sure. Thank you, Ashley. Sure. I have Catherine with her hand up. Let me allow you to talk, Catherine. And you are muted. Unmute yourself and you could ask your question. Hi. Um, are you able to hear me? Yes. Great. Um, Ashley, thank you so much for your uh, time and information. My question pertains to a website that um, we're developing and it provides a service. So it would have unique coding in that website. Is there a means to protect that? It's unique. I haven't seen it um, any, in any form um, online. So was wondering if there's a way to protect that. Sure, so I'll preface my remarks by saying, of course, I don't know the unique case here. Um, and I also am not privy to give legal advice. But what I will say is that copyright protects the expression. So it would not protect any sort of method or um, process that the website is offering, but it would protect potentially um, any photographs or the arrangement of the, you know, the text and the the layout of the um, the well, I shouldn't say layout, but the the dis overall design of the page would be protected. But if there's some sort of you know service it's offering, it would not protect that service. Okay, and I think that then answers um, my follow up, which is, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar. There's a lot of AI coding mechanisms like chat GPT and stuff like that. And I was um, curious if, if those had um, any protection once you perhaps modify them a little bit. Um, so anyhow, I think that answers my question for both of us. I really appreciate your time and information. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Ashley, I think Susan might have some insights on that question. Susan, did yes. you have anything you wanna add? I, I wasn't. I can't press buttons worth a hang. Um, I, I just wasn't sure whether Ms. Getz was asking whether there was a way to provide your source code for registration to the Copyright Office, but not have to disclose all of it. Maybe I misunderstood your question. The answer is they 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 do have a system for redaction, uh, but I'm not an expert on that. I just wasn't clear. Ms. Getz on your question. Well, um, I appreciate that. I think um, my lack of knowledge in this area is um, what's missing here. And uh, I do better with the concept that we're working on than um, other things. And also just to say this is um, intended to be for nonprofits to try to facilitate collaboration and coordination. And so um, it's just been posed to me that there should be some protection on it but my sentiments are if it can help somebody I want it out there so um, I was um, I'm the a weak link in the question so I'll, I'll get myself better educated <laughs> thank you you're not a weak link by any means I'm glad you're asking these <laughs> questions uh, your your source code obviously would be protected by copyright I was just answering it your question from a um, from a registration standpoint. I appreciate what you're saying, though, that you may want to dedicate the work to the public domain, and I'm taking away from Ashley's words, so I'm going to step aside. But what I wanted to say here was, you're, you said that there are a number of parties involved, and I would urge you to have a written agreement that covers who does what, who owns what, if there's no ownership, what's to be done, et cetera, et cetera. 
because that's something else I get an awful lot about. People unhappy at their relationships and now they want to know what can be done. Oh, good advice. Thank you very much. I, I'll, I'll pursue that. Thank you. Perfect. We have a question in the Q&A and it might need some um, follow-up or some clarification. So if you want to ask this, please raise your hand. It's if the article is published by a publisher, does that work? So, um, so, I guess, so I will say that the, if, and I hope I'm understanding the question correctly and correct me if I'm not, um, the work, when you submit the application, you would be naming the author of the work. So, so long as the person submitting is the author um, or representing the author, then the author is the owner and the, the creator and the owner of the work. Now, if ownership has been transferred to another party, say a publisher, um, then that would need to be reflected on the application as well. And then they would be the owner of the work. Um, but to answer your question, yes, either way, that work can be registered. It's just a matter of who's named as the owner of the work legally. Perfect. That, okay. And let us know, attendee, if uh, it's an anonymous attendee, that a little scabber shy, I'm sure. But let us <laughs> sure. know if that worked for you. And I see Susan has her hand up. Did you want to say something, Susan? Yes, I'm going to intervene again because <laughs> I want to say a big shout out to Ashley and her office. I will say that in all my years of work, I have never seen a better example of technical writing than Circular One. I have loved Circular One Copyright Basics all these years. I cannot tell you to how many people I have recommended that work and I was a little worried when several years ago the Copyright Office decided to do a, a plain language rewriting of its uh, circulars and fact sheets that made me very nervous because I had never seen anything better than Circular One. So I will tell you that Circular One is still an excellent document and when Ashley mentioned it I hope that everybody noted that because you really should go read that from soup to nuts it's an extraordinary document. Great, thank you for that. And we still have, we have about five more minutes or so for questions. So if you have a question, again, raise your hand to speak or type your question into the Q&A. Well, I'll ask a question. <laughs> it's a question that I get quite a bit, but I really don't know the answer because I haven't kept up to speed on uh, the, when a work is unpublished. I know that I can register that work with the Copyright Office, uh, but I don't know how much of my unpublished works I can register. In other words, do I need a separate application for each unpublished work, or is there some sort of group filing? And it is the group filing area where I think a, a lot of people in my experience stumble. They don't know what's possible with group filings, but they're always looking to try to save some money so they don't have to do one application, one fee, one work. Yeah, so we do ha now have a application that allows for unpublished works. It's called the GRU, the Group Registration of Unpublished Works. Um, we, I believe we have a circular on that application type alone and there are a lot of stipulations around that, but it is it is possible. Yes, I believe it's up to 10 works. I keep saying I believe because I used to be a copyright examiner a while back, so I'm, I'm stretching a little bit, but yes, that is an option. Um, just be mindful of the requirements there. I see a question just came into the Q&A from Sandra. What are the common questions that would be helpful to have answered? Um, well, I can just give a few key takeaways, I guess. Um, if you if you remember anything about copyright, remember that you're all copyright owners. The moment you fix a work, it falls within the scope of copyright protection. So, you know, if you take a picture, if you write a letter, we're all copyright owners. That's number one. Um, another thing that I haven't mentioned, but I love to emphasize is that there's no age requirement on copyright. 
um, protection. So the author can be, you know, as as young or as old as as they are, and they are still considered the owner of that work. Um, so I encourage those of again all walks of life to register your work. Um, the other thing is, um, I don't, I'm trying to think what what are some of the key questions we get. Short uh, another big one, especially with USPTO on the call. We, copyright does not protect short phrases, names, titles um, that doesn't fall within the, the scope of copyright law. And that's probably what we see get refused quite a bit. Um, another thing that falls, especially with business owners, when you're talk, thinking about your logo, simple geometric shapes and fonts, those are not um, protected. So there does have to be a degree of creativity in order for that to receive a um, registration. And then I guess lastly, I'll just reiterate that the, the prerequisite is the process. It's it, You do not have to get your work approved in order for you to file an infringement case. If you submit your work to the Copyright Office and for some reason it gets refused and you have that refusal letter, you can still file an infringement case. Um, I know I said that was the last thing, but the last, last thing is um, if you are seeking representation, um, as I mentioned, the CCB, the Copyright Claims Board, is a great resource um, to file claims of, of smaller uh, monetary value. And if I might also ask Ashley, I know sometimes people are very nervous about sending deposit copies in with their application as they are required to do because they're worried somebody will come to the office and look at their deposit copy, maybe even copy it uh, by photocopy or writing it out by hand. Uh, how would you respond to them? Well, I can I can say that your work is safe at the copyright office. It's probably most safe at the copyright office. However, um, there are you can either send in a physical deposit or um, a photograph of the work. Um, or an electronic version of the work. So as long as we have identifying material that will allow us to see what the work itself looks like, um, you do not have to send in a physical copy, but um, we have a lot of safety procedures. We've got a, you know some important stuff in that office. So we're definitely doing our best to keep it safe. Can others look at it? Can um, I on a whim look at it? Um, I... I have not seen that scenario. I don't believe so. Of course, um, examiners um, and our staff can look at it because we are a very collaborative team um, and we analyze the work quite extensively. But in terms of those outside of the Copyright Office, no. I have one more question in the chat. Um, it's Ashley, can you put the resources that you mentioned in the chat? Sure, absolutely. And I want to thank you. I'm going to stop the at the Library of Congress. I'm going to go there next year. <laughs> anyway, yes, thank you for that nice information, that great information on copyrights. Um, and uh, we will take an hour break and we will be back at one o'clock and we will have Susan Anthony doing her presentation. Uh, so now everybody could go get lunch and then we will return back shortly. Okay. Um, welcome back to the World Intellectual Property Celebration. Uh, this morning, we had Ashley Tucker from the United States Copyright and Office present um, Women in the Copyright System in Copyright Registration. This afternoon, we will hear from Susan Anthony, who's a uh, attorney advisor at the trademark office where she is the me member of the trademark team. And she, her presentation will be on intellectual property and indigenous peoples, culture, heritage in the US and abroad. As we had earlier this morning, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A. After Susan's presentation, we will have a Q&A session. So uh, with that, I introduce Susan Anthony. Thank you, Susan. Thank you very much, Steffi. And since I'm not sure that everybody was with us this morning, I will just let you know that I have been working in intellectual property protection and enforcement in the U.S. and abroad for nearly uh, some 
for some years now, we'll just leave it at that. So I would say that if you remember that commercial from Sears, I come from the softer side of Sears. I come from the softer side of intellectual property, everything but patents, but I do know something about patents and hopefully that will serve us well in our work today. I see we have 10 intrepid travelers. So that is very good. Uh, you will be uh, receiving some tests throughout uh, this presentation. I first wanted to say that I come by my love of New Mexico, honestly. I lived in Albuquerque when I was younger. My father was in the United States Air Force and stationed at Kirtland Air Force Base. I lived in Albuquerque when I was in junior high and high school. Now you might well want to know just when that was and discretion is the better part of valor and I shall not tell you. But let me just say that I went through school at a time when current events were offered by film strip accompanied by a recording. And when the film strip needed to be advanced to the next picture, it was advanced by a beep. So if there is anything that I am discussing and you wish I would move on, then if you would just ask Mr. Garcia to be unmuted and say beep, I'll know that I need to move on. But I have visited several times since my youth and I am considering Albuquerque for retirement if I ever get off the uh, Fauci Pelosi retirement plan. So I'd like to begin by taking a poll and Mr. Garcia will help me in this poll. So the first question is, how many of you claim to be in business? Please answer yes or no. How many of you claim to be in business? Oh, we seem to be evenly divided. Of those of you who claim to be in business, how many of you have trademarks? That is our second polling question. How many of you would have trademarks or do have trademarks? I'm not sure if our, Chris, has the second poll gone up? The second question, how many of you have trademarks? It has five of the six said no, and one said yes. Thank you. For whatever reason, I'm not getting them on my screen, but that's, that's fine. Ah, I see it there, all right. And then the next question is, how many of you have copyright? Five no's and zero yeses. How many of you have patents? No patents. And then how many of you have trade secrets? like Coca-Cola and Kentucky Fried Chicken. I'm just asking, how many <laughs> of you have trade secrets? One yes and four no. Two yes, four no. Uh, thank you for playing along at home. I very much appreciate it. Now I'm going to tell you what it tells me. I like to do this survey of small business when I go out to talk to small businesses in the field. And I've been doing this on behalf of the United States Patent and Trademark Office since 2005 or maybe before then. I was in private practice, then corporate practice. And for the last 20 years, I've been at the US Patent and Trademark Office in the Office of Policy and International Affairs. So part of my work is to go out and touch someone, to go out and work with small businesses to introduce the uh, intellectual property basics. 
some people might be confused. Why is she talking about all intellectual property when she is from the patent and trademark office? And narrower still, she said she is a senior trademark attorney. Well, that is because we have three branches of government. I think we all know that. And the US Patent and Trademark Office sits in the executive branch. The US Copyright Office sits in the legislative branch. The US Copyright Office handles registration, but both offices handle policy. And our offices also uh, provide intellectual property training, not only in patents and trademarks, but also in copyright and trade secrets and domain names, which is one of my great loves on which I have been working since 1994, when it was just a little twinkle in the trademark attorney's eyes. So I want to talk a little bit today about how intellectual property changes when it goes abroad. And I also wanted to talk uh, a little bit about indigenous cultural heritage, since I do appreciate that there are 23 federally recognized tribes located in New Mexico, and we may have some uh, tribal representatives on the telephone today. So when it comes to protection and enforcement in the US and abroad, well, I gave you some very basic basics about intellectual property in the US. And I'm going to go back over your, your poll results because it worries me a little bit. I, I asked that question, how many of you claim to be in business? And when I go out in, in the field to offer that question, people are often offended. What do you mean claim to be in business? If I weren't in business or interested in business, I wouldn't be here. But there's a catch to the question. Then I ask how many people, and I don't ever let anybody put their hands down. This is when I go to the field. I don't ever let anybody put their hands down until they have a no. And when they have a no, then they can put their hands down, but I ask them to keep their hands up. So I ask how many of those who claim to be in business have trademarks? Well, at least four uh, people in the audience claim to be in business. And so unless you are promoting your products or your services without using some kind of name, some kind of identifier, I can't help you. I think you thought I was trying to trick you because you don't have a registration for your trademark. But actually in the United States, trademark rights are based upon the common law, upon use of the mark in connection with goods or services. And if you are using the mark across state lines or between the state and another country, then you can file for uh, trademark registration, federal trademark registration with the US Patent and Trademark Office. So that was kind of a tricky question. That was unfair of me. Then I asked how many of you have copyrights? And again, there were four that claimed to be in business. And everybody said, no, no copyrights. We don't have any copyrights. Copyright, as we heard from our speaker this morning, protects literary and artistic expression. So you might say, and I certainly would say this about myself, I am neither literary nor artistic. However, I have quite a few materials within the operation of a business that may be or are protected by copyright, such as logos. We discussed that a little bit this morning. Websites, we discussed that a little bit this morning advertising and promotional materials, materials for our employees or materials for our customers, such as uh, slide presentations. So we actually have quite a few copyrights and I'm sure if I were to ask this question again, how many of you have copyrights, you would all be quick to raise your hands of those who are in business. And then I asked how many patents? Well, that wasn't a trick question. You generally know whether you have a patent or not because it is a government grant for which you must apply and be granted or, or not. And then last, and Chris was trying to help you here, how many of you have trade secrets? Well, I was really excited that two said they do because you undoubtedly knew that even if you don't have the Coca-Cola trade secret or its equivalent, or the Bush's baked beans trade secret or its equivalent. 
I've always thought the dog was going to break, but the dog never has. And those are stellar baked beans, I have to say. But in fact, a business of any size has a number of trade secrets. And it can be as simple as the list of customers, the list of suppliers, your business plans, your business strategies. All of those are examples of trade secrets that you have as a business. So I should have asked Chris uh, to take a poll on whether anybody is seeking to export. When we studied the list of people who had signed up and the profiles of the people who had signed up for this program, we didn't see that anybody was necessarily thinking about exporting at this time, but that's good because I've got, I've got you in time. People tend to put on their U.S. hats for intellectual property when they think about export. They tend to think that if it's this way in the U.S., it's this way everywhere. And unfortunately, once you leave this country, the gloves are off. There are some similarities in types of intellectual property, but there are differences in protection and certainly differences in enforcement. Let's talk a little bit about those similarities and differences. When it comes to trademarks, in the US, I said that registration was not required in order to have trademark rights. We are a common law country. But in most other countries of the world, in most other countries of the world, you are required to have a registration of your trademark in order to have adequate trademark rights. Trademark law. I won't say it is identical across the country, but it's, it's scalable. There are a lot of similarities. Then copyright. Well, copyright is a horse of a somewhat different color. That is because most countries are members of one or more multinational copyright treaties. So once a work is created in one country, it will be protected as a copyright in another country. Now, this morning, our speaker emphasized that in the United States, fixation is required in order to have copyright rights. But interestingly, that's not necessarily true across all countries. For example, in Thailand, dance may be copyrightable. Well, in the US, that makes sense. Dance would be copyrightable, provided it is fixed in a tangible medium of expression. But in Thailand and in some other countries, they protect dance that is not fixed. They may protect extemporaneous speaking lectures that are not fixed, meaning fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Once I have written it down, sculpted it, painted it, etc., that is fixation. Well, that doesn't sound too bad, but I would tell you that there are many differences among basic copyright principles from country to country. And goodness knows the enforcement of copyrights in the different countries of the world are really quite a patchwork quilt. What about patents? Hmm. Well, in the US, we have uh, patents for utility patents, invention patents. We have design patents for an ornamental design on a work of manufacture. And we have plant patents. There will be some variations in the types of patents as we go from country to country. There will also, of course, be some differences in enforcement. And then last, trade secrets. I hope nobody's thinking about where do I register or record my trade secrets because you don't do either. You keep them secret, you play them close to the vest. In the United States, in order to maintain a trade secret, you need to protect it by reasonable efforts. Now, whether an, a, a, um, an effort to protect a particular asset, to protect confidential business information that gives you a competitive edge, whether it is um, a, reasonably, a reasonable uh, effort or not, could depend upon a court's finding. It's very difficult, I think, to determine whether uh, and how to protect any particular asset of information using a reasonable effort. 
and this is often done in conjunction with experts such as lawyers, cybersecurity experts, and the like. Obviously, that's probably a more sophisticated analysis than you need for protecting your list of customers or your list of suppliers, but keep in mind, you need to make a reasonable effort to maintain it as a trade secret. The downside of trade secrets is that you can legally reverse engineer a trade secret. So some of the inventions, for example, that people would like to maintain as a trade secret rather than pursuing a patent may not lend themselves to this because a trade secret can be legally reverse engineered. And so people need to decide whether within, with any particular invention, whether it can be reverse engineered and how difficult it would be to do so. So that's the big picture really on US versus abroad. But I said there would be tests and here comes another one. This was a test that I had years ago when the United States government first opened up the STOP initiative to try to help uh, businesses face a more level playing field across the world. And so I received a call. I think I probably took the very first call on the STOP hotline, which the USPTO continues to run to this day. And the person was very upset because they had just discovered that they were being ripped off. And I asked them, and this happened to be coming from another country, I asked them if they had uh, secured their intellectual property um, in the US. And I really don't care overly much about that answer, but it tells me something about the steps that the company takes in thinking about their intellectual property as an asset that must be protected. And then I asked them whether they had taken any steps to protect their intellectual property uh, in that particular country. And I can still remember the silence on the telephone line. I think they thought I had gone brain dead because I, I had not heard them when, when they said to me that they were not in that country. They're only in the US. And certainly they have no interest in going to that country now that they've been ripped off. So. The company wanted to know what we, the US government, were going to do about it. Uh, I thought the better question was what were they going to do about it? And so let me pose that question to all of you. And Chris, maybe you'll want to unmute the line if anybody cares to, to try to answer the question. What would you recommend to the company that they do? They've had their intellectual property taken in another country. Please raise your hand if you'd like to speak, or you could type your answer into the Q&A. There's a veritable stampede, Chris. I don't know whose hand to select first. <laughs> we do have an an IP attorney who might want to answer that question online with us. Oh, nothing like putting him or her on the spot a little bit. And not everybody works overseas. So I won't, I won't keep you in suspense any further. I will give all of you the answer. The answer is there's not much to be done unless perhaps the intellectual property of which we are speaking is a well-known mark. And by well-known mark, I mean the mark is well-known to the public in that country. For most of us, that is not going to be an option. Did this company have a patent? Well, unfortunately, there is a great time sensitivity to getting a patent. And so if the person in the other country is already inventing and shipping, that doesn't appear to be an option. Trade secret, hopefully never left this country, or if it did, it was guarded, heavily guarded. And what about copyright? Well, 
that's difficult because even though copyright is protected, as I said, in a, across the world, because most countries are members of one or more multinational treaties, it's very difficult. Enforce, the enforcement picture for copyright can be very, very complicated. And unfortunately, given the nature of copyright, as you can appreciate, it goes up in smoke. It's a blazing fire uh, shortly after it is it is out there and unprotected. So that's a very different, uh, very different discussion. Maybe we'll have time for that in the remaining Q&A. So that's a pretty bleak picture that I've painted and how did that happen? This is something that I think that US businesses do not fully appreciate and that is that you can be a victim of intellectual property theft from abroad even though you're not abroad. And how in the world would that happen? And that happens because bad actors are what I like to call bad eggs. Are you a good egg or a bad egg? Like Linda asks. So the bad eggs read the USPTO and other intellectual property office databases. They go to trade shows. They read uh, industry magazines and they become aware of products or services and then they go to various other countries and they file for trademark protection or uh, obtain a patent, et cetera, et cetera. So this has always been a problem and that's why we suggest to people when you're looking at what, how should you structure your intellectual property strategy internationally and when should you think about it? I had just said to you moments ago, I'm glad you're here because now is the time to think about it. You want to think about your international strategy from the get-go, even if you're not there yet. And so when you look at protecting your intellectual property, you're considering generally, and as a federal government attorney, I can't provide you legal advice. I'm just suggesting to you what I used to do, but your, your work may differ, your attorneys may differ. I just want to give you a general outline of how people typically look at the world. When you're trying to figure out where you should protect your intellectual property, you're going to be interested, obviously, in the countries where you are selling your products or offering your services. You're going to be interested in um, countries where you're thinking about selling your products or offering your services. You also may be manufacturing offshore or in other words, outside the United States. We hope you aren't, but you might be. And, and if you are, then you need to think about, mm, if I am manufacturing my product or parts of my product, I may need protection in that country, even where I am exporting for, where, where I am manufacturing for export only. It depends upon the laws of that country. Then I also may need to think about countries where counterfeiting and piracy are high. Should I get some defensive protection there? And then last, what about trade secrets? Well, again, I want to, to protect my trade secrets. I want to keep them secret. I don't register, I don't record, and some companies will tell you that they won't even take them outside this country. That again is a business decision and a legal decision. But wait, there's just one more because it's something that I really enjoy talking about, and that is domain names. I'm sure that those of you who are in business probably do have a website, or even if you don't have a website, you do have a domain name that you use in connection with getting email because email has overtaken the world by, by some years now. And so when you're thinking about domain names, you may be thinking about .com, but you also could be thinking about the more than 1,200 other uh, generic top-level domains that we started adding in 2012. Or you could be thinking about CCTLDs, country code top level domains. You could be thinking about, for example, .us, which is the country code top level domain for the United States. Or you might be thinking about .ca for Canada or .ch for Switzerland or .cn for China. 
keeping in mind that in any of these, um, when you're talking about a domain name in the GTLDs or a domain name in the CCTLDs, you're concerned about, in part, preserving your place in line so that if and when you get there, you can say, hello, I'm local, I'm promoting to a local market. But you're also protecting yourself against cyber squatting, which is when people take your trademark and they register it in a domain name and then you've lost that opportunity. I could go on and on, but you'd probably say beep. So let me just talk for a few minutes about resources for protection abroad. We do have one-stop shopping. We have a number of multinational uh, filing treaties. They are not substantive law treaties, they are filing treaties. For example, the Patent Cooperation Treaty, which covers utility patents, the Hague System, which covers design patents, or the Madrid Protocol, which covers trademarks. Most countries are members of the PCT, most countries are members of the Hague, an increasingly large number of countries are becoming members of the Madrid Protocol. I believe we're up to 130 now. All of these provide the option for one-stop shopping. In other words, you file one application, uh, one fee, one attorney, and then you seek to expand the reach of your intellectual property rights across the different uh, countries of the world. Keep in mind though, because people get very excited when they hear us talk about one fee. Oh, goody, does that mean if I use any of these filing treaties, then I have a much uh, lower filing fee? It doesn't work that way. If there are 10 countries to which I want to extend my intellectual property rights, then I have one plus two plus three plus four plus five, et cetera, through 10 filing fees that I need to pay. But I only have to do it with one fee. So there's, there's a great appeal in that, and many companies can and do use the PCT or the Hague or the Madrid or all of them. We do have a robust set of resources for intellectual property. We have the Copyright Office. The representative spoke this morning, and it's an excellent resource. We have some copyright information on the USPTO page, simply because we do advise uh, small business on the full range of intellectual property, but we generally do send people over to the Copyright Office and help them navigate the copyright.gov website, which has, uh, gosh, I, I really like it. And I have appreciated all of the considerable work that they have done to provide meaningful resources in copyright. I'm also very pleased to say that we recently updated our patents basics page, our trademarks basics page. I do think that the trademarks basic page is a, is a tour de force. It's a work of art. You really do need to check it out. And we also recently put up what we call IP identifier, intellectual property identifier. Uh, I've been on the team to, to do this. It is a, a well, not only a refresher it's a, or a refreshment of our IP needs assessment tool that we've had for some years, but it's just a, a complete, let's, let's completely redo it. And so the, the first couple of parts of the IP identifier are up, but we're still working on the advanced module and hopefully uh, we'll get this done within the next few days, I hope. So there are lots of resources out there, but part of what I do in my day-to-day -day job, <coughs> excuse me, is to help people understand how to navigate the, the website because I appreciate, it seems like old hat to me, but that's because I'm there almost every day. And then last, on working with attorneys. Since we're all US based here, I can simply uh, mention to you and uh, don't need to talk to you about the foreign domiciled uh, citizens and, or foreign domiciled applicants and registrants in trademarks. That's a different rule. But by and large, for US business, you can pursue your own federal trademark registration. You can file your own patent application. You can certainly file your uh, 
copyright application as well. Do you need an attorney? You are not required to be represented by an attorney to do any of these things. But is it a good idea? Well, I think so because it can actually be rather complicated. But as I tell people when they're thinking about patents, yes, unless you are an inventor who routinely files patents, do think about getting an attorney or using a pro bono resource if you qualify. For trademarks, I always tell people it's sort of like filing taxes. If the idea of filing your own taxes makes you want to throw up in your shoes, I caution you. Please take a look first at our Trademark Information Network videos, TMIN videos that are on our website. And after you go through them, if you say, I've got it, and I don't feel like throwing up in my shoes, then you'll probably just be, feel fine in pursuing your own applications, but we don't give refunds if you made a boo-boo. And for copyright, well, there too, I always tell people it might be a good idea to consult with an attorney initially, particularly if you're going to be filing multiple applications for various types of work that all pretty much look the same. Get an attorney to work with you on the first application so that you know how to do them subsequently. And if you're thinking about working with attorneys abroad and the idea of going abroad makes you nervous because you think you have to go out and find an attorney overseas, Au contraire, you can work with your own attorney here in the US. A, a good trademark attorney, patent attorney will have an, an international network of patent attorneys and agents throughout the world. The trademark attorney will have uh, a network of trademark attorneys and agents throughout the world. Copyright attorneys, often your trademark attorney can handle basic copyright issues and maybe even some advanced copyright issues. But if you're a copyright creative, you may want to find somebody who specializes just in copyright. So I did say that I wanted to talk a little bit about cultural heritage. As I mentioned at the outset, there are 23 federally recognized tribes located in New Mexico. And yes, tribal members do make use of the intellectual property system that I've just outlined, whether it's patents or trademarks or copyrights or trade secrets or uh, domain names. And at the USPTO, we also have some other tools that are useful, such as the Native American Tribal Insignia Database where we do urge uh, federally recognized and state recognized tribes to record their tribal insignia at the USPTO at no cost. This enables our uh, trademark examining attorneys to compare applications for marks, whether they are um, to, to compare the applications for trademarks to the the insignia in the tribal insignia database to see whether any of the tribal insignia perhaps pose a likelihood of confusion to the registration of the application that the attorney is reviewing. Also, uh, the Indian Arts and Crafts Board at the Interior uh, monitors the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, which provides protection for um, Native American and uh, Alaska Native um, artists and artisans. In speaking with a friend recently, she talked about the intellectual property system. She's a Native Hawaiian. And she said, Susan, I want you to understand that we're really talking about two systems. We are talking about the intellectual property system, and we're also talking about an indigenous system. And they are two very different systems. So when I think about New Mexico, I of course think about the uh, Zia Pueblo and the sun symbol, which is the symbol on the flag of New Mexico. Uh, these issues are very complicated. And for those of you who know about the Zia sun symbol, you know that um, it is a, a sacred, a religious, symbol. And the, the Pueblo of Zia would tell you that some years ago, many years ago, the symbol was taken and then at some point it became used for the New Mexico flag. 
It's a very interesting story. And if you will look on the internet, you will see that the then governor of the Zia Pueblo, uh, Anthony Del Grito, um, had uh, spoken to the WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, uh, in December of 2018. And I, I do urge you to go look for that at the WIPO uh, Intergovernmental Committee, IGC, on intellectual property and tradition, pardon me, genetic resources, traditional knowledge, and traditional cultural expression. And he spoke to the WIPO IGC, all these member states, there are 190 plus member states that are looking at these issues and looking at the possibility of an indigenous uh, treaty uh, for the indigenous peoples of the world. Now it may or may not go to treaty, um, but uh, this is the work of the US uh, PTO on behalf of the US government. We do represent US interests at the WIPO IGC. And we are, as I say, but one of 190 some odd countries that are there that are trying to determine whether in terms of genetic resources or traditional knowledge or folklore, what we more frequently call traditional cultural expression, if all of those things uh, together, how they should be protected and whether it should be by treaty or as the, the US suggests, and we're not the only country with the suggestion that maybe a soft law approach uh, may be better. So the reason why I raised this issue and it's because it's, it's actually one that is very, very important. As you know, we're living in some rather different times now and things that uh, maybe were done historically are things that bring some discomfort, much discomfort to companies today. And so I can tell you that among uh, the tribes, cultural appropriation is a subject of great concern. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry, I've had a cold coupled with terrible, terrible allergies for the last several weeks. And I haven't talked this much in a couple of weeks, so it's really catching up with me and I apologize. Uh, cultural appropriation is of great concern to the indigenous peoples uh, located in the United States and, and located frankly in other countries of the world. It's, it's a concern, but it's also increasingly of concern to uh, companies in the US. And so uh, I've been talking with a number of companies that have been doing some very different things and they, now take the position that when they are going to use indigenous people's cultural heritage, they want to look at it like we typically look at licensing under Western intellectual property uh, system by asking permission, negotiating terms and conditions, for example, payment and at attribution or two frequent uh, conditions and um, the companies also may need to address who would own the creation of, of any intellectual property that may be created pursuant to this arrangement. I do expect this year, next year, we're going to see some very interesting developments in that regard. The, um, there is a trade organization with which I have been working that does hope to produce a set of guidelines, hopefully by year's end, that will help guide attorneys uh, when they are working with uh, a client that says, I would like to use an indigenous people's name or words or uh, design, but I don't know how to do so. We, we hope to better prepare, I say we, I've just, I've been asked for my thoughts whenever they produce these guidelines, but certainly that's the extent of it. Uh, but these guidelines may be useful for the intellectual property attorney in the future who is asked by a client about working with tribes and how that could be undertaken. Of course, that will remain a, an entirely voluntary situation, but uh, it is something that 
uh, people are doing in various pockets of the country, but it hasn't really been, uh, I don't think a lot of people have seen this work to date. So it will be interesting as we move forward to see um, what developments lie ahead of us. So I would anticipate that in conjunction with that work, we'll also be having a program later this year, early next year, in which uh, the USPTO will be involved um, that might, for example, talk first about these issues in the context of the fashion industry. So that is all that I wanted to bring to you today, but I think that the most interesting part of any presentation is in the Q&A. So maybe we could just open it up for Q&A, Chris. Yes, if anybody has a question, please feel free to type it in the Q&A or raise your hand. And I see Steffi has her hand up, so you go right ahead, Steffi. Uh, Susan, is that um, the, the Indigenous database, is that searchable? Is the Native public? American, uh, do you mean the tribal America, pardon me, the Native American tribal insignia database oh. is searchable. Uh, it, is okay. a, it is a website, uh, pardon me, a database that is maintained by the USPTO. I also can tell you that although we have been operating this database for over 20 years, we have uh, only around 80 some odd insignia recorded. And since any one tribe, whether federally recognized or state recognized, may have more than one insignia, we do have tribes that have recorded uh, all of their insignia or more than one of their insignia. And so that uh, represents only a very, very small number of the 574 federally recognized tribes and the, I believe, 63 or so state recognized tribes that could record their insignia in the database for no charge, but haven't. Um, as your question intimates, Debbie, it's also a, a good uh, idea. Perhaps people don't know what the tribal insignia are out there, and this may help give them an idea of what they um, perhaps should avoid adopting when they are uh, considering a mark for use and registration. Okay, thank you, that was great. I have another question regarding um, trademarks and registering your trademarks. I think it's with the, um, is it with the customs or exporting the ex uh, Yes, in um, to better protect yourself, and I'm glad this person has raised this question, it has to do with uh, recording your trademarks, they have to be registered. Re you can record your registered trademarks and your registered copyrights with U.S. Customs. That's one of the significant advantages, as I said before, and as our speaker this morning said, uh, registration is not required for either copyright or for trademark, but it does provide you with some uh, significant advantages, or as my a uh, colleague who was raised in the 1980s likes to say, Susan, it provides you with cool stuff. So one of the cool things is that you can take that registration and record it with U.S. Customs and Border Protection. This will help protect against uh, infringing uh, counterfeit and pirated products coming into the U.S. Of course, you do need to work with CBP to uh, provide them with any information of which you may become aware about these uh, unlawful shipments coming in. But you needn't stop at the border. You can take your uh, intellectual property in various countries of the world and record your intellectual property with the customs offices of the various countries. Now, are you going to do this in every customs office of the world? Uh, no, probably not, because I, it would be expensive. The expense with CBP is not too much. It's $190 for nine years per registration, as I recall. Uh, but if, for example, you're concerned about um, counterfeit products or uh, pirated products coming from China, for example, then you may want to record your intellectual property with 
uh, Chinese customs. Now, keep in mind, you would need to get your trademark from China to record it with customs there. And China also has a registration system for copyright. I have heard that Chinese customs will accept a US registration, but uh, since China also offers a registration, it may be a good idea to get um, a registration in China and then record that with uh, um, the Chinese customs. But I'm glad that the person raised the question because as you can see, this gets me on a roll and I don't beep myself. Um, China also will permit the recordation in the Chinese customs of patents. And you might say, wait a minute, Susan, utility patents, invention patents are way too complicated. How in the world would Chinese customs ever be able to figure that one out? And I, 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 I won't pass judgment there, I don't know, but I think what they're really talking about is design patents because China also recognizes design patents. As I said before, when we were talking about patents, different countries may have some different kinds of patents, but China does have design patents. It doesn't um, look at, it doesn't examine them as we examine design patents here in the US. Again, another variation, as I say, as we move from country to country to country, differences. So when you're thinking about protecting yourself, I hope you're thinking in terms of a pincer move. You want to make sure that you not only look again at the countries where you're selling or going to sell, also countries where you're manufacturing and countries where counterfeiting or piracy are high. And it is in those countries where you will want to think about getting your intellectual property and also, as the uh, speaker just asked, getting your uh, intellectual property protected against um, infringing exports or infringing imports. Imports, yes. So you really got to think a very uh, comprehensively here. And the time to do it is from the outset. Why do I say that? I say that because, first of all, any of you who've ever looked at patents, you know that they're time sensitive. Uh, you may think, oh, well, I always knew that in the US, I had a year to go uh, from the time of disclosure of my invention. Well, that's true. That's called a grace period. But some countries have no grace period at all. Europe. Many of the European countries have no grace period. So that means if you disclosed in the US, you're already sunk in Europe. And some other countries only have a six month period of grace, et cetera. In addition, as I tried to illustrate through my mention about cyber squatting and trademarks, uh, people who become aware of your trademarks through a trade show or uh, an intellectual property office database may then seek to register your mark in other countries. Those of you who have registered in the US, of which I think there was maybe one person in, in the group, um, know that you have to demonstrate that you're actually using the mark. But in almost all of the other countries of the world, you can register and you're not required to show use. You can be challenged for non-use at some point of the road. But initially, you're not going to have to show use in order to get a registration. So when you think about that, oh, gosh, then hopefully you'll see how you could be subject to theft before you, before you even really started out. So that's why I say the time to think about whether you're ever going to go global or even if you're not going to go global, but you just want to protect yourself sitting here in the U.S. from theft from abroad. What are the steps you need to take? At the end of the day, you may say, cost too much, don't want to do it, whatever your reasons, that's fine, but go in at least with your eyes wide open. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, Susan. We had two, um, just one comment and uh, another request in the Q&A. So, uh, one person asked for the database for the Native American insignia and I put it in the chat. And another attendee wrote that uh, Pendleton, the company Pendleton works uh, very closely with Native Americans to respect their intellectual property. 
and I chatted an article about that from their website as well. Well, I, I appreciate the uh, shout out for the database. And I do hope that there are uh, either indigenous peoples representatives online or people who will reach out to uh, tribal representatives to say, please do record your insignia in the database. There is no charge for it and it may help you. I have another question and it has to do um, with trademarks. Um, so when, when somebody has a, an idea that they're looking to patent, there's a world um, databases that you can search and you can see the different, some of the different countries that are participating in that. And that's the part of the prior art search. Now with trademarks, is there any public worldwide database and, um, or you still just have to protect them in each country? It doesn't matter if it's prior art search. All right, let me see if I can break this down. When you're looking at pursuing a patent for an invention, you're looking at prior art, uh, which could be, for example, a, a previously existing patent, or it could be a publication, or it could be uh, sale or use of the invention. You're looking for prior art anywhere in the world. You do need to obtain patents. Patents and trademarks are territorial, and that means you need to obtain a patent and a trademark in any and every country where you want to be able to enforce your rights. That's okay. just a sad, harsh reality. But when you are looking at trademarks, you're clearing on a country by country basis. That's different from patents where I said, you're trying to figure this out worldwide. Um, you need to determine whether in any particular country of interest, there is any conflict. And by conflict, I mean a, when we look at a proposed mark and we compare it against a, a mark that's already in the marketplace. We are comparing, we're, we're applying a two-part test. One part of the test says, does that second mark look the same or sound the same or mean the same as my proposed mark? And the other part of it is, are the goods or services the same or related? For example, shoes and shoes. Well, those are the same goods. If I said shoes and shoelaces, those likely are related. If I said shoes and sunglasses, mm, I don't know. I have to, I'll have to look at it a little bit more closely. So when I am trying to clear a mark in the US, it's a common law country. So that's going to be a little bit of a headache because I have, to look some, I have to look beyond the US Patent and Trademark Office. The US Patent and Trademark Office maintains its database, publicly accessible database of federally registered trademarks and also applications for federal registration. And we have all of the prosecution history, all of the documents are available online, publicly accessible 24 seven. Well, that's not the whole world there, though, because I said it's a, it's a common law country. And so I may also consider that there are any number of trademarks that are used in the US that are not registered. And so I have to figure out where I can find information about them. And so what people typically do who are doing the searches themselves, they'll look at the um, obviously the USPTO database of federally registered trademarks and applications for federal registration. They'll look at, uh, we do maintain a list of the state databases, but it can be a little bit difficult to search state databases because 
they're all over the board on, on searching. And they also may look at domain names, but since the EU put uh, the, the uh, general data protection regulation in place, that, that made searching for domain names uh, a lot more complicated. So what many people do is they hire a professional search firm, which has an advantage over you and me, and that is that they are actually professional searchers because trademark searching is not as simple as you might think. I've had people call me and say, I didn't find anything identical in the database, Susan, so that means I'm, I'm good to go, right? No, but I really can't tell you how to do it. I can just tell you you haven't done enough. So um, that's US searching. And there are a few common law countries in the world. But as I said before, most countries uh, are first to file as opposed to first to use. And so in those countries like China, you can simply file your application without actually using the mark and a person can get a registration. So if I wanted to go into another country, and China is kind of a bad example because it's very difficult to search in another language. Um, but that's really what you would need to do is other countries are civil code countries, not common law countries. So everything that you need to know pretty much is going to be in that uh, country's trademark uh, registry. You may want to work through your US counsel who then in turn can reach out to a trademark agent or attorney in that country to conduct a search and make sure that there is no issue. There is one worldwide database and it's available through WIPO, W-I-P-O. Um, I can't think of the name of it, but it's, it's a global brand database. But don't, you shouldn't get the impression that there's just one database um, that you need to consult for a trademark anywhere in the world. It, it doesn't work that way. That's a good place to conduct a search online, certainly. I, I wouldn't rule it out. But when it comes to trademark searching, it's country by country by country. Perfect, thank you, Susan. Uh, Steffi, do you wanna take the last word so we could uh, dismiss our attendees? Let me, uh, okay. let, let me spotlight you. And you're ready to go. Okay, thank you for all for attending. Susan, that um, presentation was very informative. I just loved it. That was great. Uh, asking the questions was great. I would like to thank all the participants for attending this uh, third, uh, the TCA's third annual World IP uh, until um, IP Day, and uh, we'll look forward to next year's. And uh, thank you again. Thanks all the speakers for presenting, and thank you, Christopher, for monitoring our webinar.